Hello, Fit Sisters. It's good to be with you. My name is Mitzi Semo, and I am of Samoan, Hawaiian, Japanese, and German descent. I currently serve as a member of the Relief Society General Advisory Council. Before I begin my remarks, I want to express the love that our General Relief Society presidency has for you. President Camille N. Johnson, Sister Annette Dennis, and Sister Kristen Yee work closely with the Brethren to enhance this experience of our Relief Society sisters and to incorporate true principles and doctrine from our prophet. We love you and hope that you will feel this love is a conduit of the Savior's love for you. As sisters in Zion, we belong to a sisterhood that can comforts, teaches, ministers, and blesses each other. We belong to the Relief Society. Sisters, I felt impressed to talk to you today about what it means to me to be a part of a community of belonging through Jesus Christ. I pray that what I share with you today will inspire some of you to believe in your divine destiny, feel a sense of belonging as sisters in Jesus Christ Church, and become so rooted in his gospel that you inspire others to come unto him. Elder Patrick Heron said this about our goal of becoming, and I quote, even as the storms of life in an often troubled world pound upon us, we can cultivate a growing and abiding sense of joy and inner peace because of our hope in Christ and our understanding of our own place in the beautiful plan of happiness." End quote. Recently, I participated in a walk to support breast cancer research. There are hundreds of people at this event. Some were organized in teams with matching t-shirts displaying the names of loved ones they were walking for. Others were there to support the cause with friends and family. The park where, where we met was filled with the color pink. Sponsors have put up tents to support the walkers, and one of them was handing out sashes that had the word survivor for those who had cancer and beat it, and the word thrive for those who were still battling cancer. As I stood there looking at these sash sashes, the event volunteer kindly asked which one I was. At that point, a flood of memories came back to me of two years ago when a very nervous student doctor explained to me that the results of my mammogram and biopsy had confirmed a cancerous mass. I remembered the doctor's visits, surgery, treatments, and how kind and supportive the medical staff was to me about my pro prognosis. I remember my personal life being overwhelmed with my daily tasks, which included caring for my family and fulfilling my calling. I also had just started a master's degree program and worked full time. In addition to this, my husband was just called as a bishop. I had taken for granted that my health would sustain my busy lifestyle, but I quickly learned that my faith would see me through the difficult moments. I survived my cancer with the faith and support I received. Looking around me at the other women fastening their sashes, I had a deep sense of love for them. These were women with whom I could share my cancer experiences, and I knew that they could provide me with the relevant insights because they had fought a similar fight. At that moment, I recognized that I belonged to this community. I wanted to participate more fully and spread the news of how ongoing research can help us understand how to save lives. It saved mine. Google's definition of community is a group of people or living things that share common characteristic or characteristics, such as a location, culture, or values. When we recognize that we have similar experiences with others, we open our hearts and lower our guardrails to let them in. I belong to many communities, such as the Polynesian community, the Relief Society, mothers over 50, and grandmothers. Still, the community that brings me the most sense of purpose, healing, and joy 
is the community of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or as Elder Kieran calls it, the Church of Joy. President Nelson said, The gospel net is the largest net in the world. God has invited all to come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. There is room for everyone, end quote. In a world of individualism and division, seeing the good that can come from our differing opinions is sometimes challenging. I find that when I'm confused about who I am and my role in this life, the only source of truth, truth and peace I can go to is to be in the company of my Heavenly Father. I've learned that our thoughts and words become more celestial when we talk with God. Elder Russell M. Nelson said before becoming the prophet, and I quote, even more amazing than modern technology is our opportunity to access information directly from heaven. It is his generous invitation to ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you, end quote. Prayer is not an occasional event, but an opportunity to strengthen our relationship with the Lord. He wants to hear from us always. He wants to be a part of our lives. Alma gave his son Helaman wise advice that would serve him well when he led the stripping warriors to battle against the Lamanites. He said, counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. President Nelson has asked us to be mindful of our words and thoughts when we pray. He shared, and I quote, As you think celestial, your heart will gradually change. You will want to pray more often and more sincerely. Please don't let your prayers sound like a shopping list. The Lord's perspective transcends your mortal wisdom. His response to your prayers may surprise you and will help you think celestial, end quote. Miracles happen when we pray. Our hearts are turned to Heavenly Father and our Savior, and they will provide us with the strength we need to get through our challenges. President Camille N. Johnson advises, quote, when we prioritize daily acts of devotion to Heavenly Father and the Savior, including prayer and study of the scriptures and the words of the living prophet, we invite the Spirit to be our constant companion. End quote. Sisters, I'd like to do an activity with you. Let's take a moment to think about our personal prayers. I want you to reflect on this question. If you could hear the Savior praying to the Father for you, what would he say about you? I'll ask it again. If you could hear the Savior praying to the Father for you, what would he say about you? As you ponder on that, on that question, I want you to think about how it made you feel to think about what the Savior would say about you and on your behalf. I hope you felt his love for you. Jesus Christ prayed for the Nephites when he visited them in the Book of Mormon. And I want to quote a few of those experiences that are taken from 3 Nephi, chapter 17, verses 13 to 21. And it came to pass that when they had all been brought and Jesus stood in the midst, he commanded the multitude that they should kneel down upon the ground. He himself also knelt upon the earth. And behold, he prayed unto the Father. And no one can conceive the joy which filled our souls at the time we heard him pray for us and to the Father. I'm sure your feelings are, are similar to the way that those wonderful saints felt at this time, hearing the Savior pray for them. Then in 3 Nephi chapter 20, 19, verse 29, the Lord prays again for his disciples and says, Father, I pray not for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me out of the world, because of their faith, that they may be purified in me, 
that I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one, that I may be glorified in them. When you say your personal prayer tonight, I invite you to imagine Jesus Christ kneeling next to you and praying to Heavenly Father for you as you pray to him. You will feel a personal connection with our Savior and gain insight into his will for you. You will know that you belong to his community and you have been given him, given to him out of the world because of your faith. Now I'd like to speak to you about faith. We strive to fortify our, our faith through centering our thoughts on Heavenly Father and our Savior. We practice our faith by attending Sunday services and renewing our covenants through partaking of the sacrament and attending the temple regularly. But what happens when our faith is tested? Or as Peter called it, when we face the trial of your faith. There are unexpected and unplanned events that have happened or will happen in our lives that leave us to question our faith. As a mother, I could sympathize with Lehi's wife, Sariah, who mourned for her sons as they journeyed back to Jerusalem to obtain the plates of brass. Every time our children left our home, I worried about their safety until they returned. I've tracked their travels through different apps and called them constantly to ensure they weren't lost. Sariah couldn't track the movements of her son, sons, nor could she call them. Her faith had been tested, and she could only take it out on or take out her frustrations on her husband Lehi. However, when her sons returned, there was much celebration. I love the visual in First Nephi chapter five verse seven, where it says, "And when we had returned to the tent of my father, behold, their joy was full, and my mother was comforted." Then in verse 8, Sariah comes through her trial of faith with a strong testimony of the divinity of Lehi's calling. It reads, And she spake, saying, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. Yea, and I also know of a surety that the Lord hath protected my sons and delivered them out of the hands of Laban and given them power whereby they could accomplish the thing which the Lord hath commanded them. We all have or will experience trials of faith. Some of you may be experiencing one right now. Elder Neil L. Anderson said, the gift of faith is a priceless spiritual endowment. How do you remain steadfast and immovable during your trial of faith? You immerse yourself in the very things that help build your core faith. You exercise faith in Christ. You pray. You ponder the scriptures. You repent. You keep the commandments and you serve others. I love how Elder Anderson mentions serving others is building our core of faith. Serving others is one way that we demonstrate our faith in Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity to radiate light and peace to others. Some sources of light come from small and simple acts of faith. Even if your faith is small and growing, it will still provide much needed light and warmth to others, desperately seeking comfort. As you use your faith to relieve others, I promise you that you will feel the peace and the Savior's love for you. The last item I wanted to discuss is how wonderful it is to be part of the Lord's Church. Elder Del G. Renlund said, the church, and I quote, the church is simply ordinary people, disciples of Jesus Christ, gathered and organized into a divinely appointed structure that helps the Lord accomplish his purposes, end quote. I want to illustrate the importance of being guided by the Lord's organized structure through an experience we had about 15 years ago while living in American Samoa. A local government agency launched a campaign on island to teach village mayors the dangers and signs of tsunamis. They helped them prepare evacuation plans for their villagers. 
as part of the evacuation exercise, mayors carved out routes into the hills for the villagers to retreat and would ring a bell as a warning sign. These bells were used daily to signal when it was time to say family prayer, but this ring would be different. The unique cadence would signal that everyone needed to evacuate up the prepared pathway into the hills. A few months later, on September 29th, 2009, we experienced a 7.9 earthquake just before 7 a.m. It generated a tsunami killing many people on our island. Over the next few days, we learned the circumstances behind those who lost their lives. Some were children walking to school. Others were driving to work. A few were elderly ladies who were weaving mats. Unfortunately, a small number didn't believe that a big earthquake and receding water lines were signs that a tsunami was coming and they refused to evacuate. Those mayors who prepared for the tsunami were able to save their entire village population by helping their villagers understand the dangers and teaching them where to evacuate when they heard the bells ringing in a particular way. Hundreds of lives were spared because of these diligent mayors. The evacuation plan succeeded because the villagers obeyed the sound of the bells and were informed where they needed to go. As those villagers demonstrated, their will to obey, obey showed how much they trusted in their mayors, and it also showed how much the mayors cared for their people. Our Father in Heaven has made a plan for us that includes covenants that will lead us to safety and lead us home. He has appointed prophets and apostles to teach us the safe routes to return to him and how to listen for the bells that signal danger is coming. Sister, sisters, I testify that President Russell M. Nelson is, is a prophet of God. I know that he and the 14 brethren who serve by his side, serve by his side, are charged with ensuring we are informed of Heavenly Father's plan for us and the joy and peace it brings as we stay faithful to the sacred covenants we make with him. I know that our Heavenly Father and Savior Jesus Christ live. They love you. And I'm grateful for the atoning sacrifice of our Savior because it allows us to return to live with him again. As you increase your faith and serve others, you will understand your role in this beautiful community and be guided by the Holy Ghost. We will be blessed with his guidance as we actively participate in our Heavenly Father's work. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.